Master Jensen, how are you doing? Doing well. Uh, hanging in there. I had uh, some changes in these past three months again. Yeah, I know. Um, Tell me about your school. How are things going? You know, from our inception, it's been nothing but uh, <laughs> craziness um, with uh, U.S. Taekwondo and that whole background. So um, we, we've made a couple moves since the initial opening. Um, trying to find, you know, just the right spot, the right amount of space, the right setup, uh, right amount of rent, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about your school, like, I mean, you've, you've had, it's Lake Country Martial Arts is your school, and yes. you've had it for now, what, 10 years? More than that? Yeah, 10 years in May. About yeah. 10 years. And um, for those of you don't, that don't know, uh, Master Jensen and I used to uh, work at the same schools called USA Taekwondo, and uh, the time I was going off to Korea was the same time that school was closing down and out of that school was born Lake Country Martial Arts. So yeah, tell us about how that's been going and where you guys are at now. Um, we've been uh, building the Heartland area for, for 10 years now. So yeah, anniversary came up in a couple weeks ago. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, we were, years we were at a tournament the day the school closed and uh, driving back from that when the email went out and uh, we're all driving and you know communicating between us through cars you know check your email as we're as you know passengers of course are, are checking email on their uh -huh. phone and yeah what is it going on like as of the previous day which was the day we were teaching things had been shut you know officially closed yeah uh, and so we were, that was a tournament on sunday and uh, that's how our school started was waiting in the parking lot to meet with our students that didn't get the memo or uh, didn't, you know, or just wanted answers because all the locks had been changed and everything uh, was uh, suddenly the rug pulled out from under everybody on their training. So that's how Lake Country Martial Arts started. And uh, Master Holes was kind enough to be there with us for our first testing and uh, inaugural. Uh, yeah. So how far, how have things come since then? Are you still in that same location? I know you had kind of a temporary space when I left you. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we, uh, that space, it worked out fairly well, but, you know, there were no changing rooms. It wasn't, you know, a, a real, the, not, not the ideal setup. So we've been there for, you know, four or five years and wanted to find something uh, a little bit better. So we ended up moving into another space that didn't work out well <laughs> and oh, no. as soon as we got in there it was like all right how do we get out of this because that was mm -hmm. a bad situation um, then we ended up in um, like a more of a retail plaza space which was kind of uh, a different for us you know they always say yeah. location 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 so that should have been the ideal location yeah it was really not you know oh, the no. amount of traffic that went through there I can maybe uh, out of the three years we were there I can count on one hand how many walk-ins we had so oh man the struggle there too yeah and so this this past year up until um COVID hit we'd been teaching out of a church mm -hmm. and, um, so you know nice group of people you know big open uh their their leadership hall so that's where we taught out of and yeah so then COVID hit everything got shut down there and so we had to, you know, like you guys, like everybody in the country yeah. had to mm -hmm. scramble. All right, how are we going to continue to teach our students? So mm -hmm. you know, learning curve of using Zoom and, and pre-recording classes and uh, getting comfortable on camera and, and teaching that way. It's so, so different, isn't it? Oh, yeah. There's, there's a lot to learn. I feel it's kind of interesting, though. I feel like I'm a white belt again as a teacher trying to, like, figure out, all right, how can I make this really exciting? Um <laughs> you know, like the audio quality is not always perfect, and people are kind of going in and out, and mm -hmm. they, they get their heads chopped off, or you're just looking yeah. at their feet, or yeah, yeah. By the way, Master Jensen, I should introduce myself, uh, so I'm not just hanging out here on the side. Uh, my name's Trevor. I'm Master Holes' younger brother. I actually uh, was at USA Taekwondo, but that was a long time. Yeah, ago, I think it was before. a little before your time. I think. Um, okay. Yeah. I used to try yeah, to I heard stories of Trevor, but I don't think. I <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> He was just kind of running around biting people's kneecaps yeah. out and stuff. You know? it's a unique, <laughs> unique strategy. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, the, the whole COVID 
uh, has really stretched us. So, yeah, uh, we, I don't know what you've done, but on March 16th, we just had to close down. It was so crazy because we were like, oh, we'll just ride this through, you know, and then like every school that Sunday just was like, we're closing, we're closing, mm -hmm. we're closing. It was right around where the CDC guidelines said only 10 or more people can congregate or whatnot, and every school just closed down, and we're like, well, I guess we have to close, yeah. and um, and we are still not reopened yet. We've been doing, okay. you know, a lot of schools are reopened now, and we were thinking about reopening, but right when we were about to reopen, the riots hit, and it was just like this really difficult time, and it was like kind of hard to get like momentum, like, hey, we're coming back, guys, and like an exciting moment. Um, and also, um, we were a little worried about like COVID-19 spiking, which is kind of what is happening mm -hmm. right now. So, um, and then- Where are you guys in Texas? So we're in Kyle, which is about- like 30, 30 minutes, minutes south, south of Austin. Yeah, okay. which is the capital. Um, so we kind of took a different path. Like a lot of people, their strategy has been to kind of use live classes as a temporary fix until they can get back in person. But we're like, you know what? We don't know what this world's going to be like here in a couple of months. Why don't we just try to like double down and make like the best live service possible? Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've been really focused on. And I'm building out all these things. Like we have these online courses that they can take, which we call our toolkits. So there's like a white belt toolkit, teaches you everything you need to know as a white belt, yellow belt toolkit, kind of gets them ready for testing and stuff like that. There's only so much you can do on a live class. Like, you know, you, I'm sure like the defenses mm -hmm. and the grappling techniques yeah. is kind of hard to do when you're all by yourself. You know, you can do some drilling and stuff, but um, we were able to, you know, record all that stuff with all in-depth explanation and put it together in videos so the students can learn that on their own time while we keep the live classes very aerobic and kind of animated. And we've been working on a lot of things, like we have this mm -hmm. workshop time that we just added before the live class where we can work on their forms and their defenses. They basically can kind of, you know, sit around, socialize and work on their forms and their defenses while we watch them and give them, you know, critiques and stuff like that and kind of help them along. Um, so we're trying to figure it out, but mm -hmm. it's definitely challenging. I'm curious, because we've definitely found some stuff works really well, translates set like virtual mm -hmm. kind of, uh, medium. Uh, what have you found? Because uh, I'm sure that you're doing stuff as well that has worked, has not worked for your school, your students. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had big ideas, you know, when we first got to, to digital classes, like oh, all these I, you know, things I wanted to do over the years, like mm. uh, special seminars and things. And just so ended up off um, right away, we did two digital, you know, pre recorded classes a week and then a Zoom in you know live class on saturdays so they had the opportunity nice. there are two classes during the week jump in on a live on the weekend i mm -hmm. did a like a just a five or six week um, uh, splits progression kind of training um mm -hmm. so shorter videos versus the the, the full length because that was one of the things you know after we did it, it was like all right we got to get some feedback yeah and yeah nobody nobody liked the full length classes because right away i was like i'm yeah. getting so much done 40 minutes there's no transition time we got so much done <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, because it's too long yeah so, yeah and now the lessons are much shorter you know 10 to 20 minutes tops mm. and so now because we're able to come back in person a little bit um you know with restrictions six yeah. people i can fit six people on the floor keeping about you know mm -hmm. three mats in between each person okay uh, so everybody right now can come to one indoor in-person class uh, weather permitting we're doing an outdoor class which then is open to you know whoever yeah. wants to come yeah I have a number of students that aren't able because they have an at-risk person in their household that can't come back so i'm continuing to zoom with them just uh one-on-one -on -one private lessons once a week so I've got their short digital lesson at the beginning of the week, then some couple in-person opportunities. Um, we then, just had this this new mandate that says that everyone uh, has to wear a mask. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything like that in uh, Wisconsin? No, not that they've, per I mean, it's still recommended. Um, so all of yeah. my, all the members are wearing masks. Um, I leave how, it up how is that working for you? Are people able to breathe and work out with that mask on? I don't have any of this, this, the students are not required to wear a mask, so. Yeah. Um, I was I have, trying to do some private and just talking and trying yeah. to be animated. I was like hyperventilating. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah. I was like, man, this is hard. Um, you know, we've been thinking about maybe doing like more like Tai Chi, like re like, you know, working on forms and like yoga stretching kind of stuff. Low exercises. intensity. Like that's low not intensity gonna... kind of stuff. Um, and then use the live classes for more of the high intensity stuff. Sure. But it's, yeah, it's challenging trying to figure it out. Um, but I think the first person to really nail it will, uh, will do well. So hopefully we'll see. Yeah, it has to be a lot more animated and entertaining on the, the video lessons yeah. and, than in, in person. So had to come out of my shell even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something that I was, you know, concerned about was when our classes start back up again and we have the kids, we use our face so much in mm -hmm. talking to the kid yeah. and kind of corralling them and getting them to do what we want. Um, that I'm worried about having to wear a mask is going to make it so much harder to communicate and, and yeah. you know, kind of um, get them to do what we want and, and still be engaged and not be just bored. Uh, that's something I'm worried about. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, I've had that issue for sure is they can't hear me sometimes. And I got a, a clear face mask because I've got a, one student that really relies, um, you know, uh, on being able to read lips. Mm -hmm. um, and teaching so having a mask so like she couldn't understand the thing i was oh, saying man. yeah that's and kind of hard. So, but then the, you know the full face mask that makes it hard, even harder for people to hear so yeah. Yeah, still figuring that out <laughs> yeah. yeah well i know we only have you know 30 minutes with you so i want to make sure we're moving forward M many of my students don't know much about you can you tell them a little bit about your training experience and what's kind of got you to where you are today um yeah absolutely so i i started certainly much later in life than I would have liked to in martial arts overall. So I've been training for 15, 16 years now. Um, so with that time, you know, it started with Taekwondo, but there was always the, the mix of some weapons training, some jujitsu, some judo. Yeah. Uh, so since, you know, since I've got my, my own thing going on, I've continued to seek out, you know, mm -hmm. ways to expand those areas. So um, right before the shutdown, I was able to test my purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Awesome. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Trained with, you know, a number, in a number of different systems with um, the Filipino martial arts, because after, you know, we did XMA, you know, that's, that's cool when you're younger and, you know, it's fun to watch, but it's just kind of like, all right, where do I want to put my energy? And yeah. Uh, mm. My, my experience with the Filipino martial arts as far as practicality was much more than a lot of the other um, weapons uh, systems, which is kind of why I've gone yeah. away from, you know, the, the, the Japanese sword training and that kind of thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, not, I would, I love it, but I just don't have the time to dedicate to it and, and, uh, and the resources around me to find good people to train with. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it's, you know, it's all been, with, for me, with that, it was videos and learning through books, but there's really nobody in our area to, to yeah. study. And would have had to do a lot more traveling that way. So, so that's how I got into the Filipino martial arts. I was actually watching. I don't know if you remember the show Human Weapon. Yeah. Um, years ago, so they, you know, they had two guys that they went around to different countries and trained in different martial arts. And one guy trained, you know, the traditional way outside hardcore, and the other guy trained in the gym. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of met at the end and there's a couple different shows like that, but then they competed against somebody in, in that system and to kind of see which methodology, uh, what, what kind of advantages they had. Yeah, so yeah. that's, that's when I first saw the Filipino martial arts outside of just the little bit we did in class, which was just kind mm -hmm. of controlling the sticks around in a couple little patterns. And at the time I was like, yeah. this is, this is so lame. Mm -hmm. um, compared to like nunchucks and sword and staff mm -hmm. so um, after seeing that episode I was like all right I really have to find out more about this and um, that's actually you know, what we're using right now for our self-defense training because we can't put anybody in headlocks or bear hugs or any of that mm -hmm. close stuff it's like all right all of our self-defense training now is is weapons it's, yeah. it's sticks and then that's going to transition of course well to improvised weapons and anything like that so it's a perfect social distancing uh, mm -hmm. uh self-defense tool is a stick yeah uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> that stick that, uh, we've been introducing a, a lot of students earlier to that than we might normally have in the past but um the way the filipino martial arts wor work the way it's taught is a lot different than what we might see in japan or china whereas you know you don't learn weapons till you're really advanced in your empty hand skills in the Filipino martial arts, you start out with a weapon. Yeah. Because the idea is um, because 
the Philippines, you know, is still under, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Philippines, a lot of different islands. So there's a lot of varying viewpoints on how things should be done. And, you know, it's still very tribal and everybody's carrying a blade of some kind. So it's still, you know, in constant use. So you, you need to get somebody combat effective essentially as, as soon as possible rather than mm. you know, learn empty hand first. And then, you know, five, eight years down the road, then we're going to start to teach you a weapon. The idea, you know, if you put a, a blade in somebody's hand, you know, it takes very little training to them to become at least decently effective versus, mm. you know, anything, you know, you know, and similar to modern military too. If you get to hand to hand, something has gone terribly wrong you've run out of ammunition, you've run out of everything, or you get to that, that close combat uh, situation. So, um, you know, uh, the Filipino martial arts have been used pre-Spanish occupation up through World War II and, you know, still being used over there. Um, there's Christians and Muslims over there, so there's, there's conflict um, in certain areas of the Philippines because of that. Um, and during the, 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 so there's kind of three terms that we usually we look at with uh, Filipino martial arts. So there's Kali, Eskrima, and Arnis, and kind of synonymous for the most part now, but um, Kali is considered an older term for, for the, the systems that predate the Spanish occupation. So um, my understanding of that word, and there's, a, there's, there's not a whole lot of recorded history on that. So my understanding of that word comes from a word, uh, it's Kalis, which is a word for sword. So Kali being a shortened uh, term for yes, the words. When I first started learning about Filipino martial arts, I remember people used to call it Kali a lot of places that I, I picked it up. And now I never mm -hmm. hear that term very much anymore. It's uh, kind of come out of use. Yeah, so um, I think for the most part now, Kali people refer to as an older form, which is more blade oriented versus stick mm -hmm. oriented. Mm -hmm. Because you know, once you start training with a stick, that opens up a whole other world of possibilities of things you can't do with a blade as far as disarming and blocking and you know you can't just grab somebody's stick you know or blade and yank it out of their hand like you can with a stick um so there's there's systems that have evolved you know out of just using the stick as your primary weapon so just as an impact tool versus you know working off an mm -hmm. edge um, and that's where a scrima comes in during the spanish occupation uh, the scrima is the spanish word for virtually translates to fencing or like skirmish so they watched the Filipinos training with the sticks, which was then a, a stand-in training tool for the blade, and it reminded them of their, their fencing training. Mm -hmm. And uh, then kind of uh, after, Arnis is more of a, a modern term for um, the Filipino martial arts that we see. And another, another Spanish word um, that comes, you know, that they've used to describe that. Um, and in the use of the harness that held armor together, I believe is the translation translation of Arnis. Mm. Um, so I've got a, a, a whole arsenal here around me to kind of go through some of the yeah, the show us some of your stuff. Um, so this is uh, one of the, the systems I've been training in or had been training with is uh, Pekiti Tercia Kali, mm. and this is their preferred uh, blade, which is a Gunting or a Ginunting, excuse me. And this is the blade that the Filipino Marines train with and use um, because it works, you know, as a machete, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of the Filipino blades are dual purpose. You know, it's a tool, but also a weapon. Yeah. Um, so this one kind of reminiscent of like a Gurkha knife where it has the edge is on the inward curve. So mm -hmm. it bites in, you know, a lot more when you cut in versus slicing. Mm -hmm. Then you have a bit of a, a back edge here as well for kind of almost like when you throw a hook punch you can uh, hook with the blade um, as well with that so um, this particular one horn handle a lot of the handles are really nicely designed to uh, stay in your hand very well so when your hand gets sweaty you don't disarm yourself and throw your weapon away yeah, which is awesome. a nice feature. You get the guard there too yeah um, minimal guard you know that's something we see in a lot of Filipino weapons is very minimal guard kind of tells you something about the mindset of their worry mentality is very little defense yeah. it's very much <laughs> offense you know yeah, all out um so that's uh that was from a tournament two years ago um so one of a number of different tournament styles i competed in um this was a low low armor tournament so rattan sticks but only gloves and helmets um, versus like the full, like we see in WeCAF, the full, you know, chest guard, uh, mm -hmm. full armor. 
Um, so that was a new experience for me uh, doing that. Yeah. You know, uh, you get a lot you're more. Funny, you're funny with that sword there. <laughs> no, not this one. This was my this was my first place uh, trophy. Oh, trophy! That's a trophy. really trophy. nice yeah. prize. Wow. That, you gotta um, get with that. Like, I feel like trophies have gone downhill so much. Like, yeah. It used to be like wood and metal, and now they're just like they fall apart before you yeah. can get them in your car. You know, it's just so bad. Yeah. I have a bunch that are in pieces in the garage right now, like just uh, moving uh, them. All of my old trophies are, are I, I glue them back together and stuff. They barely can hold together. It's terrible. Yeah. So definitely uh, this is the way to go for future trophies. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and over here, so there's some, you know, some common blade shapes. This is actually cold steel is making a really decent, uh, mm -hmm. you've got their machetes. But this, this one is the Barong blade shape, so it's kind of a leaf shaped blade. They've got mm -hmm. a nice uh, handle on here too. So, you know, it really does some benefit when you're training because one of the things we want to be paying attention to is edge orientation. You know, mm -hmm. when we've got a stick, you know, people don't understand how to line up their edge. So sure. having something like this to go out and, and train with, you know, is a good benefit. And these you can pick up for 30, 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not the greatest steel, but, you know, it'll get the job done um, mm -hmm. for some training or some yard work as well, too. So, and then one of the other kind of blade shapes that is pretty uh, uh, unique mm. we see is the, the crisp shape or the wavy blade yeah. shape. Um, you know, all of which, you know, you wouldn't want to be cut with any of these, so... <laughs> There's advantages and disadvantages with these weapons, but I think they would all be pretty terrible. I mean, this just looks cool, so that's just the best thing. <laughs> this one is uh, this one's actually made out of aluminum, so this is more for uh, demos and forms. So you can, you know, it's super lightweight. But there's yeah. a uh, there's a uh, a grandmaster in Michigan that makes uh, training blades for his students. So I was able to get a couple of things from him. That's cool. And then, in addition to you know swords, uh, this you know the crisp, the wavy shape. That's pretty much just that's combat you know that's not a tool for anything other than you know yeah. use in, in that but um, there's also you know similar to a tomahawk shape these axes they're um, this is also made from the same guy so aluminum trainer mm -hmm. I'd definitely like to get a live version of this someday um, but uh, so the these are associated with, what was that can I see the end of your handle looks like you got some use on that that bad boy there what is that for yeah. you stabbing that's people? Just that's just carved that way. <laughs> it's a wicked weapon. You, you could definitely make use of both ends of that. We got the back. I would not want to get stabbed with that. But uh, a tool first, just like in most cultures with axes, and, you know, becomes a weapon, you know, as, as well when needed to. Um, this particular, the, the axes are often associated with headhunting tribes in the Philippines. Um, so you'll see these as listed. If you go to the... Uh, traditional Filipino weapons website, you know, they call these headhunter axes. And there's a whole plethora of different blade blade shapes from them, which is, is pretty awesome to mm. see. Nothing like uh, a good headhunter axe, you know. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's when I sleep next to my bed, I always have my headhunter uh, axe. You know, in case someone yeah, breaks that, in, you know, I just... Yeah, well, you, you, you joke, but you literally did pull yeah, one no, of I mean, my trying axes is just shrunk in heads, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> You got, you know, you got to set a precedent. You got to set an example. And that's, that's probably the best way. And uh, so one of the other probably more iconic weapons too, mm. from, you see from the Philippines, of course, is the balasong or the butterfly knife. Um, more of a modern invention, post-dating World War II. Traditionally, these were made from the, uh, the, the leaf springs, actually from old uh, Jeeps, U.S. military Jeeps. Mm -hmm. So oh. they took the springs apart from them and, and forged these blades out of cool. uh, supposedly originally just as like a utility knife. It'd just be like your Swiss Army knife that somebody carries in the pocket. But uh, yeah. a lot of servicemen were over there for a number of years and, uh, you know, brought a lot of these things back with them, learned some, uh, just like the servicemen that were in Japan, you know, they learned some of the martial arts in Japan and China, brought it back with them, same with the Philippines too. Um, and actually kind of our modern way of boxing. Like if you look at the old pictures, old photographs of, you know, bare knuckle boxers, you know, their stance, boxing changed quite a bit with the GIs over in the Philippines and the way that the Filipinos fight empty handed 
as very much like our modern boxing stance and the way they move. And uh, those, uh, that, that way of training got picked up by them. And uh, we see that in our modern boxing too. So there's some, some influences we don't always think of uh, with the martial arts or with the Filipino sure. martial arts. Particular. Uh, I also so, know, I, I'm curious, are there any, because um, I once had to get one of those for a show I was working on uh, as a prop, are there any special rules uh, in Wisconsin for Bali songs or butterfly knives? Because I know in New York, I, I had to get one. Dude, they used like, to fall no, the you can't own these. They're, they're scary, dangerous weapons. And I'm like, yeah. compared to all the other scary, dangerous weapons. Uh, most, of the time, most of the time people hurt themselves with these and then, yeah. you know, they're playing, you know, flip them around, but uh, they used to fall under the category of switchblades in Wisconsin, so they were banned for that. Um, but now, actually, switchblades are legal. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, this is clearly not, you know, doesn't function at all like a switchblade, but they, they put it under the same category. Um, so they're, they are legal. This one is actually a training version, um, so it's not a live edge, but it was made, same maker that made live ones. This is one of my instructors brought back from the Philippines because um, that was actually his hometown is where this came from in Batangas in the Philippines. Mm. So he came back with some live ones and he came back with some trainer versions as well too. So That's fantastic. Cool. That's really cool. So that's, uh, you know, and now the modern version, you know, everybody associates Kali and Eskrima with the sticks. So stick yeah, 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 yeah. Always, always a stand-in training tool initially for, for the blade. But um, so I've got a couple examples here. Um, this one I bought uh, from an instructor in Hawaii at a world tournament. This one's actually made out of guava, native to Hawaii. Huh. Um, so this one is super dense. This, this does not flex at all. It's, it's pretty heavy duty. So that'd be more of a fighting stick versus like the rattan we use for training sticks. So like, uh, like this one. So the rattan has a fair amount of flex, which means mm -hmm. you're not going to this is, these are training sticks. These would be tournament sticks. You're not going to hurt the other person as, as much, and they're more likely to break. Um, so you see a lot of sticks breaking in tournaments and things like that. Mm -hmm. but much lighter weight, much easier to uh, move quickly with. But then that, of course, changes your, your training dynamic. If you're not training with a heavy, heavier blade, um, and then plus when you're sparring, you know, one of the big issues is people don't respect the strikes when they're fully armored. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll come wading through a flurry of strikes and then go completely bypass long range and go right into close range. You know, meanwhile, I got hit five times on the way in. So mm. a lot of times with uh, the modern tournament rule set, and we see this with a lot of other martial arts too that have turned sport is, is uh, you know, it comes down to a lot more of just conditioning. Who has a left, enough left in the tank at the last 10 seconds to keep going mm -hmm. because uh, the, the strikes are happening so fast. Nobody's keeping score really. They're just looking for, all right, who's hitting the head more, who's controlling the ring, and who has enough left in the tank by the end. So uh, it's definitely, you know, people, the mindset has definitely shifted. You know, once you go sp more sport mode, and we see that with Taekwondo, you know, the, the, the lack of trembling shock or the strikes that used to, to need to have happen to score a point versus what we see now. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole topic in itself, how Taekwondo has changed over the years. Yeah. And uh, with modern uh, Western fencing too, similar issue. You, know, you try to you know, create it. They have electronic scoring and fencing, just like you know, we have now with taekwondo. But mm -hmm. anytime something like that comes up to try to take away human scoring error, people find ways around it. So you know, the, they make the blades so light and flexible now. They, they do these kind of whipping attacks that was completely impractical for a live blade. Well, so, it's like this um, really interesting interplay between you like for self-defense you don't need to have great cardio because usually it's mm -hmm. over pretty quickly but if you don't have a lot of hands-on experience of like you know great like distancing timing and distancing which is what you develop through competition you're not going to be effective in self-defense either so they kind of need each other you know and yeah. it's trying to figure out and and what's really interesting too is you know there's some schools thought to say well, we need to make our competition as realistic as possible, right? But then you look at things like MMA, and MMA actually has a lot of rules these days. You know, back in the olden days, people mainly people were losing was getting their like eyes gouged out and their testicles tearing off and stuff. And they're like, well, we can't do all that stuff, you know. So they got to change all the rules. But 
um, you know, it's, you know, fairly close to reality. But if you look at like that kind of a bout, you know, those people, they do like one bout like every six months, you know, mm -hmm. that's not a lot of tr competition experience in my opinion. Whereas you look at like Taekwondo practitioners because they were the sparring gear and they hit with less power. Um, you'll see people competing like every single weekend, you know, bam, 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 like always constantly competing and they get a lot more experience on timing and distancing and working with various different partners. And so it's like, you know, I think people come in on one side of this or the other, but what they, they usually miss that they, they need each other. You know, you yeah. kind of need both. Uh, and like that whole thing about cardio, like, yeah, you don't need a lot of cardio for self-defense, but it's definitely not going to hurt. It's going to yeah. you know, really help you. So. Yeah, no, the, the balance between, you know, I've, and I'm sure you have you've competed under a number of different rule sets and mm -hmm. each one has its own benefits and drawbacks, but I think you need it all to fill in the pieces of the puzzle because exactly. Yeah. Can't and shouldn't be going out getting in confrontations every weekend. So yeah. we have to come as close to it as we can. And there's no way to replicate at least that I found the stress that I feel when I compete mm -hmm. and that adrenaline response that you're likely to get in a self-defense situation. Yeah, like I, I try to tell my students, you know, if they want to be really good at competition, they got to pick a rule set and just learn to play within it. You even see that in like jujitsu now, like the rules for mm -hmm. jujitsu are getting very, it's becoming very much a game, you know, it's yeah. moving a long way away from sort of the street self-defense stuff. Um, Absolutely. And that's going to happen with any thing that you turn into a kind of, you, when you establish rules and parameters, they try to figure out ways to sort of not cheap, but like, what's the most efficient way to win, you know? And a lot of times that's not like, doesn't seem like very realistic, you know? Um, like in Taekwondo, you know, people were winning by doing cut kicks all over the place. You know, Steven Lopez was doing that cut kick and they had to ban it because it was, it was like, just, it was basically ruining the whole sport, you know? And there's examples like that all the time. You know, you see in jiu-jitsu, like, you know, lapel chokes, are becoming like the you know one of the most easy ways to submit somebody but you're never gonna see that really that much on the street you know um so you, you don't wear your full uniform with thick collar i mean or... it can it can happen but like well, in wisconsin for you know four or five months of the year everybody's wearing jacket <laughs> that's true there's pretty thick collar on those yeah yeah and actually the gracie university put out a, a video on how to use a t-shirt to do a cross choke Mm. Uh, which was pretty interesting. Essentially, you pull the you know the hem up and you give yourself a nice. I, I actually seen that exact video that you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah, it can't be done. Not everybody, you know, it in Brazil. Can be done. But the way the game, birth, like getting teach. the grips in and everything, you know, getting the grips and the way the game tends to be played and stuff, and the positions that are possible when you can grab onto a uniform is very different from you know a no gi and stuff like that. Um, so absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, exactly. I, and, and just like the other things, I train no gi and gi because, you know, there's mm -hmm. benefits from both. And I try, I was never a wrestler, so I always get smashed. Um, but I still compete no gi. Yeah, <laughs> no, but you know, don't you love it when the, the new guy comes on the mat and you, you put the uniform on him and like, he can't do anything. Because when he has the uniform on, you have complete control. Once you get your grips in, you're yeah. like, ha I win. But when the person comes in and they're not wearing like a uniform, they're wearing like a rash guard or something, they just jump around all over the place and try to be like real spastic. And actually it's a kind of, they're so slippery and slimy, it's hard to like get hold of them. So I think like the uniform has its benefits too, because it's like this humbling device, you know, it's yeah. like, oh yeah, you think you're real smart? Well, now I get hold of you and you can't really do anything. Blows everything down. It's like, no, oh, no, we're yeah. going at my pace. Exactly. Uh, yeah. There's a lot more, a lot more chaos and nogi and people sliding out of things. And yeah. Sure. but yeah like i think i think you need both you know it fills in the gaps the left exactly. by one filled in with the yeah. other is trying many different ways of competing i think is really healthy and like you said it'll teach you different pieces of the puzzle well i don't want to take up too much of your time sir but um maybe just a couple more questions we can ask you you know what are some uh, people who've been really inspirational to you um in the martial arts over the years um, uh, of course, all my instructors, you know, um, for, for the issues with USA Taekwondo, that mm -hmm. really is where my story started with martial arts. And there was an openness there of other systems and not just, you know, mm -hmm. just Taekwondo. Cause 
We also boxed. We did weapons training. So there's and jujitsu. So there was always that from the beginning. So that that was a huge influence. And when I didn't have that anymore, then then I started branching out and, and looking for other other uh, people. So you know, all of my coaches over the years, um, number of you know, I'd definitely say two as far as authors go. Rory Miller, um, great author, lot, uh, background in traditional art, martial arts, but also as a corrections officer. So, you know, he's got yeah, experience putting hands on people as well as, you know, how that translates. Mm-hmm. So, you know, really love all his books. Um, give a practical perspective, you know, to what we're doing yeah. um, as martial artists. Um, Ian Abernathy, um, really enjoyed enjoyed training with him he came over to was over in chicago a couple years in a row and he's um you know i've done a little bit with uh with karate forms through uh, a coach in madison but that's definitely not my you know i have a few katas um but not my i would definitely like to learn more but it's you know it's not been I my think system. now is the time you know i'm telling all my yeah. students like that's what you know forms were created for was solo practice and so they're kind of the perfect thing to be working on right now so ian abernathy's take on form application i think across the board is the most practical i've seen anybody you know you see a lot of the the bunkai competitions and everything is you know it's it's theatrics you know it's cool to watch but it's still not necessarily practical so his approach to forms training, kata, you know, um, I'm trying to, been trying to back engineer, you know, what's going on in our Korean forms to, to make it more understandable for people and more practical. Because us as, mm-hmm. you know, I think us as Americans are, are always like, we want to know why, well, why are we doing this? You know, what's, what's going on here? Yeah. And, you know, there's a super, superficial le- level of forms practice that, yeah, you're doing a block here, but. You know, we wouldn't do a block like that in sparring, so it doesn't necessarily uh, make sense in that kind of application. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of on the same page with you with that. I mean, I've definitely, you know, when I went to Korea, they made me like undo everything that I had learned and I had learned their special way. And it's very much, in my opinion, it's, it's trying to move away from karate and make it look like something that's uh, something else. And then when I was over there, I, I became kind of, I mean, I, I didn't realize it until later, but I came kind of bitter and resentful of it. And I was like, ah, none of this makes any sense. And it's all just to make it look different. And then coming back, I tried to sort of re like relearn the way that I used to do my forms and continue to improve upon them for application. But in that process, I also realized that they did have a few really important um, c- cornerstone things that they had developed when they were kind of shifting the forms from kind of the way they were done in karate to the way they were done in taekwondo mm. and um reintegrating that with my karate forms you know the the one when i was in college i studied karate for a long time and very intensely and that's when i really started to kind of see well you know how do you actually do a high block or a low block or a middle mm. block and um up until that point i was like man i i couldn't i couldn't block anything for the life of me you know uh, it just felt like totally inept and it was when i was in that program and like every single day we're blocking and punching blocking and punching that you know you kind of learn how to do that stuff anyway um any other thoughts you'd like to talk about or yeah just trying to figure this all out just like you guys and, and move forward and continue to grow the martial arts community and yeah. With so many things uh, canceled right now, I think it's a good opportunity for us to uh, to continue to uh, help people. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if any of your students end up seeing this, I want them to definitely not quit on you because we got to support our local small businesses and our local Taekwondo schools or, or whatever, you know, you're teaching these days um, because, you know, if you know people don't you know come in now, there might not be a school later. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Trying to gently remind people that when they're like, "Oh, I think I'm going to take the next you know three months off." It's like, well, <laughs> yeah. You know, well, we'll see when he you comes want back. Something Hopefully, back to something. You. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, it was really great catching up, Master Jensen. We're going to have to have you back on at some future point, maybe talk about something else, but. Uh, Absolutely. Wish you the best of luck with your school and everything and tell uh you know um 
Shannon and everyone that I know back there, I say hi. Will do. Really great to see you today, Master Olds. Uh, nice to meet you, Trevor. Yeah, same. Hi to all your students, and uh, hopefully can get down there someday. And uh, yeah, we're out to have you for a seminar yeah, or something, yeah. or sit in on testing. That'd be awesome. Uh, take care. Right. We'll see you soon. See you soon.